Welcome to our noontime webinar. I'm Dr. Jill Brooks, Director of Education for First Healthcare Compliance. At First Healthcare Compliance, we are here to help you with a comprehensive compliance management solution tailored to your business, be it a hospital, hospital network, healthcare practice of any size, billing company, or skilled nursing facility. For these webinars, we bring experts in from around the country to cover a variety of compliance topics. We are so pleased to have Tal Givley, the CEO and founder of Medivisor, today for his presentation on the future of health information personalization. Mr. Givley has over 25 years of product development experience holding leadership positions in technology, innovation, research, and development with a proven track record in realizing visions in startups and other corporations. Before Medivisor, Tao was chief scientist at Amdocs and led innovation activities across the company, including heading up Amdocs Technology Incubation Unit and Open Innovation Program. Tao is a prolific inventor with over 25 granted patents and many more pending. He's recognized for his passion for and expertise in innovation, being invited to speak at major industry events such as Stanford Medicine X, uh, Digital Health Summit, CE Week, Consumer Electronics Show, Mobile World Congress, and CTIA. He was also actively involved in industry forums and standard bodies, including the TM Forum, IETF, ATIS, and IPDR.org. Tao was a director on the board of IPD.org and TM Forum. He holds a dual Bachelor of Science cum laude in mathematics and physics from Tel Aviv University. Before we get started, please feel free to download a copy of the slides for today's presentation from the control panel. You do not need to request a certificate for the presentation. Your Paycom CEU certificate will be sent directly to you within 24 hours of the presentation. Additional CEU certification will be available to any BC Advantage members following accreditation in a few weeks. Please check their website for updates. Go ahead, Tal. Hi, so thanks for having me. Uh, and I, I feel honored to be uh, speaking to this audience. I'd love to know more about the participants, if people uh, can maybe introduce themselves briefly in the chat and what they're looking for and expecting. Uh, that will be uh, uh, helping us making this even more interactive, uh, which would be cool. So um, I'm going to talk to you about the personalization of health information, and I think it's something that's as you can see, uh, you'll see it's long overdue in my mind. Um, and uh, I'll basically go through this sort of agenda here. So uh, basically, I'll first spend a few minutes on talking about what, what I'm calling the problem here and uh, what is the issue. Uh, it's actually going to be uh, probably about 20 minutes plus even because we're going to go into this from a patient perspective, a caregiver perspective, a doctor perspective, um, and look at the, the issues, uh, including supported by research. Uh, and I also ran a little poll uh, as we uh, just in that, a couple of hours ago, uh, which uh, if you're online on Twitter, I'd like you to go to basically the Medivisor's profile and uh, fill in that poll. This is the page if you're looking at my screen right now. Um, and if you go to twitter.com slash metavisor and you'll see the pinned tweet at the top is a, this question, which of these types of health information do you most seek online? Uh, so all you have to do is if you're on a desktop is respond to this. Uh, this is the poll creator so I can't respond. You'll have a button that allows you to respond to that. So while we're at it, just uh, hop over there and uh, fill that in, and later we'll look at the results of what's going on. Uh, yes. Uh, so we'll look at uh, also uh, what you're thinking about this, and also more comprehensive results. And then, uh, why does it have to be this way? And uh, solutions. Uh, one of them, notably, is something that I'm creating, so I'll admit that I'm biased. Uh, about this, uh, and I have a vested interest in a, a creating a technology and a platform uh, to help address the issues that we've uh, identified together, me and my founders and the rest of the team working at, on this behind Metavisor. But there are also other solutions that uh, I'll touch on briefly. 
So without further ado, I'll uh, discuss the problem. And basically, uh, it's something we've all seen, and that's what happens when uh, people fall ill. Uh, and even more often when it's a serious or chronic illness, uh, we all turn to Dr. Google for health information. And what we find there, uh, even though there's a lot of great health information online, and actually we wouldn't have wanted it otherwise, like 20 to 30 years ago, you'd be starving for finding information. Now everything's online, but the only problem is that uh, we've moved all the way to the other side of the scale, and there's just too much information. And we really don't understand it all. We don't know what to trust. Most of what we see is not relevant to our specific situation, to what we're looking for. And uh, we don't know if it's dated, if it's a... Uh, Basically, it's uh, unreliable and it confuses us. Um, instead of uh, really reassure us, we have to spend a lot of time on this. In fact, uh, I've spoken to people and myself have been in the situation when I was a caregiver and still am, that I spend endless amount of time uh, looking online to try to find health information. This has happened to my partners as well. So it turns out we're not alone. Uh, doctors while they don't often admit this, can't actually cope with all the advancements of medical science. Part of what you were doing here is maintaining a, or a, a continued education, but really there's just endless amount of information. There's 400,000 research papers that are published annually. If we break that down, there's 9,362 research papers that were published last year on prostate cancer. 19,500 on breast cancer, and 38,000 research papers published in one year alone on diabetes. Who could be expected to keep up with all that? And it's not just research, it's also warnings and clinical trials. So in some cases, uh, people are not treated well with the standard of care, or they want to consider other options, or they need other options. And there are many, many clinical trials as well. So there's uh, about 1,400 interventional clinical trials probably recruiting breast cancer patients right now. And the doctors don't often know which of these or any new treatment may be relevant to a patient. Uh, and basically, they're dumbfounded about that. And they can't match this, so they can't keep up and they can't find it. So they resort to shortcuts. Let's take a, a quick example here. For, for instance, Supposing we have a 55-year-old woman with stage 4 breast cancer seeking a clinical trial in California. So she already knows, she or a loved one of her, or someone that's caring for her, already know that they're looking for a clinical trial. And they, most people, though, don't even know that they should be potentially looking for clinical trials. So, um, so let's look here what she would do. She would basically, she goes into Google and types in stage four breast cancer uh, treatment, for instance. Uh, there's this 2.68 million results. Uh, she can scroll down, and all of this, by the way, sounds very interesting to someone that's hoping. It's uh, from breastcancer.org, from the Komen Foundation, from uh, Healthline, from uh, the American Cancer Society, from WebMD, and on and on. We know that people go through this, not just for the first page, not just for the second page. People link on Medivisor sometimes on page 73. So we know that people actually get to page 73 on Google results sometimes, and they click us on esoteric stuff that you would imagine. Now let's suppose that, as we said, she's looking for a clinical trial. So she goes to, somebody told her about this place, clinicaltrials.gov, that lists all clinical trials, and she begins by typing breast cancer. I'm already an expert on this site, uh, but if you type breast cancer here, there's 7,465 studies. Um, but uh, we see this thing, so we'll just put open studies, so we're not we're moving the not actively recruiting. Uh, so now it's down to a slightly more manageable 2,371. But breast cancer might be probably too broad, so let's add stage four. So 
So now we're down to 666 studies. And actually, there's not so much more you could do, but oh, just a second, we, she's in California. Okay, so let's go here, there's only 346 if we look at the map down in the US and in California, there's just 130. So now there's 130 clinical trials and effectively, she needs to go one by one on these. And in fact, she probably will not limit herself just to California. She may have a, a relative anywhere else in the United States, maybe in Texas, and uh, they may be willing to travel to there for the clinical trial. So after doing California, they'll look at these 119 studies in, uh, uh, in Texas. As you can see, this becomes very, very difficult and time consuming. And uh, people that are motivated enough will spend quite a lot of time uh, doing this. And yet, we all feel alone when we're in this situation. Um, and we feel like nobody, uh, we don't know where to turn. Uh, on one hand, people are offering us help if, if, we're, in, if we're fortunate enough. Uh, but we really don't, we feel very alone uh, in this journey both as caregivers and as patients. But we're not alone, and many people have walked the path that we're going on, even though it's not identical, but there's a lot of, a lot of things we can learn from them. And not only that, they're actually usually very helpful in providing this information. I'll take a quick break before I continue just to see if there's any questions. Structurally, should I stop and ask for questions? Does anybody have a question? So, Tal, the only thing uh, is that there's an issue with the downloading of the slides. So, following the presentation, we will try to fix that. We can't do it while we're in session. Okay. And people are sending that information in the chat, uh, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, so, if you're listening to this and you're having any issues or you have, want to ask a question, feel free to send it in the chat and I'll stop from time to time to uh, look at that because I'm not looking at it while I'm uh, presenting. Okay. Yeah, I think raising the hand doesn't do much, so the best thing is to send a message in the chat to the organizers and panelists. Okay, shall I continue? Okay. Uh, let me know if I should stop. So this is the research that was, uh, I think it's still not yet published. Uh, it was uh, led by Carmen Luisel, which I uh, presented her findings uh, at a conference uh, a couple of years ago about the patient's preferences in an era of personalized medicine and a person-centered care. Uh, and she was looking at, the, uh, they did a research at a, uh, McGill University at a hospital in uh, Montreal at the Jewish General Hospital and basically uh, they surveyed uh, the patients there in oncology uh, in, a, uh, in Montreal uh, that were diagnosed with cancer uh, and they uh, were asking them about their information seeking behaviors Turns out this is the first time that information seeking behaviors have been classified in a new way compared to an old way that used to be used until then. And information, ISV is information seeking behavior. And here are some of the results of their survey that researched, I think it was 1500 information seeking patients in oncology. There's a, they basically classified into five groups, clustered into five groups. If you look here on the right, it's, there's a non-seekers. There are, are two types. There's avoiders. There's a group of people that avoid seeking health information online. And there's casual. So they may do initial information, seek a bit of information, but they're not actively pursuing that. And then there's a category of seekers, seeking behaviors. There's a networker, a researcher, and a seeker. I'm looking for the questions of the survey. OK. 
Okay. I'm missing here the, uh, the, the question, but I'll, I'll try to remember what it was. The avoiders basically don't seek information online. Uh, they, they basically get all their information from their doctors and the medical teams. The casual will do, as I mentioned, just casual surfing. The networker will try to reach out to other people uh, as a prime source. Uh, the seeker will look at online information quite a bit uh, in broad sense, uh, both to other people, but uh, also to uh, health sites, uh, communities, and so on. And the researcher becomes a very intense researcher. They spend a lot of time on this. Uh, so they're the most intensive uh, researchers. And as you can see, uh, they're split also by age group. So uh, if you look at the ages, there's a shift towards uh, more seeking and more researching in the age group of 45 to 54. And after that, there's a, a gradual decline. Uh, so in 65 and higher, you're most likely, you're more likely to be non-seekers, but even then, more than 50% are seekers of information. Um, in terms of education, the more educated you are, uh, so the, the, the less educated you are, people, the people are, they are avoiders uh, and networkers. They rely on others or avoid it completely. Um, and the researchers are, uh, are, as you might expect, more educated. And the casuals are average education level. So education level affects uh, whether you're uh, a, a inform your information seeking behaviors. Now, it's very important. This is interesting that researchers were unsatisfied, most unsatisfied with the information they were provided by their healthcare system. Uh, as you can see, they're, they're the most likely to say no, that they needed more. Uh, and they spend uh, most, more, much more time uh, than seeking online. Uh, did your providers uh, know enough about it? Again, were they satisfied enough with, the, uh, with what the provider knew about cancer therapy? Again, the researchers were un, uh, unsatisfied that the information was sufficient. Did you know your next step in care? Again, the researcher type is more likely to uh, say no, never, sometimes. And when you were first diagnosed, uh, peak of words. Okay. To, to summarize, basically, Researchers, while they're a small group, are the least likely to be satisfied with the information. The seekers is a big group. Uh, and overall, by the way, 55 or 56 percent, uh, sorry, 72 uh, percent uh, are seekers. They're networkers, seekers, or researchers. Um, and uh, casual or avoiders are most prevalent five years after diagnosis. Okay. Any questions about this research? Uh, is now would be a good time to ask that question in the chat. Okay, I'll move on. If there are questions, let me know. Um, now, I conducted this research uh, a few weeks ago, uh, about a couple months ago in March, and we asked one poll in Twitter uh, for 24 hours to see, uh, we asked the question, what, which of these types of inf health information do you s most seek online? And the reason we used the most is because we were looking for uh, polls on Twitter could only answer with one response. And by the way, only if you're on a desktop, uh, if you're using your computer, not uh, an iPhone or a smartphone. So, uh, and so they had to choose, and there's only up to four responses, so we were kind of limited. And 34% were looking for treatment options when they uh, are looking online. 31% were looking for help with the diagnosis. 13% were looking for clinical trials, and 22% advice from others. So this is how 103 votes were broken down. I'm going to look right now and see if there's any more responses to the survey we ran 
today, together with some of your responses. So there are only 18 votes. Uh, it's not uh, statistically significant yet, but it's, you, you can see here that it's a, so far 33% are helping help in diagnosis, 38% treatment options, 17% clinical trials, and 11% uh, advice from others, uh, which is uh, not too dissimilar from this, uh, and not statistically significantly different in terms of the number of uh, information items we have uh, or data points. And another survey that we did, which is more comprehensive, actually had a multiple choice. You could actually respond with more than one option. And we asked, what health information might you find useful? And we ran this over the last uh, month or so. And uh, here we gave the option to select any number of these options. Um, and seven, uh, nearly 70% wanted to learn more about the med latest medical research. And actually, treatment options became the second most, with about 58%. Uh, clin even clinical trials, uh, more than 50% of the respondents uh, felt that they were, uh, would be interested and find useful relevant clinical trials. After that, finding the best and right doctor or medical institution. Finally, discussing uh, people, uh, finding, discussing with people in my situation dropped to 30%, 33%, and financial help was about 24%. Uh, and so this was kind of interesting uh, that when given the option to respond to more questions, people actually uh, were most interested in medical research and uh, at least interested in terms of information with, with discussing with other people or finding the right doctor, but even then it's quite high in terms of percentages. Any questions uh, before I proceed? Okay. Okay, so. There are no questions, and I did upload another um, slide deck, so it's listed on there. And it works this time? It looks to be. I will let you know if there's still any problem. Okay, cool. Excellent. So we see there's a lot of people but uh, out there, and you don't know who to consult with, who might be relevant in your situation. Uh, and as you get a diagnosis, it's you know kind of a blur, and it's all about you and your situation. And indeed, every situation is unique. And the information that could help one person is not necessarily that same information that could help another. So why can't we get all this information? And we were thinking a few years ago, how do uh, we get this to be much more personal? Today, by the way, if you go online and you look for listening to music, you don't typically begin with Google. You actually go to, or a search engine in general, you begin with a service that personalizes based on your taste. So, for instance, Spotify, Last.fm, Pandora, uh, based on your musical tastes, uh, will help find the next track or the next, or help you discover new artists or new music. And same thing for movies. You'll most often uh, go to a site that understands you and personalizes, like Netflix, that knows your experiences and what you like and help match that with new information. But in health, we're still going to generic search engines and then uh, finding information that's generic. It's not personally related to us, therefore it's not even cutting edge. So we were thinking, what can we do to find this? How do we make this personal, latest cutting edge medical science, but personally treating us as unique? And connect the information and the people that are interested in that information, uh, which is either the doctors but most often actually the patients, which are eager to know this. So the quid pro quo is that people provide information about themselves. We thought you, in order to actually solve this, a system would need to know enough about the individual uh, so that they can distinguish what matters to them of all the new information and be able to cull all that new information. So basically, basically people provide information about themselves and get the state of the art of science 
plus updates. And people can also connect with each other. And we found that uh, people are very interested in helping each other. And that creates thousands of very, very lively discussions with people that are very close in terms of a medical situation uh, to other people. And their experience matters. So, uh, so if someone's part of a clinical trial or is on a specific medication or treatment path, they can really help if someone else that is about to consider that as an option. So they talk with each other and help each other. Yeah, but finding the right person to connect with is, uh, is important, so it's important that they actually be in a small circle of people like your situation because someone that is very different than you is not going to be very helpful. So it's all about that individual. And uh, we need to keep it simple so that many people uh, across a wide range of uh, age groups can use this. Right now, uh, what we've done is still focus for people that are a bit more educated uh, because they would need to uh, understand this information, uh, which is not always easy to understand. Are there any questions before I move on? So there's four questions it says here. Well, now I see what these questions are. Speaker sounds muffled. Uh, Erica, do you hear me uh, better now or no? I don't know when this question is from. This is solved. Erica, I hope I don't sound too muffled. I want to keep up to date. Got it. Virginia, we're with you. Uh, okay, Bristol Trends Practice Manager. Okay, uh, if there are front office manager, GI office in Annapolis, somewhat, oh, it's only somewhat better? Sorry about that. Um, I don't know what I can do about it right now. I'll continue, I'll describe what we've built uh, now in, or in response to these challenges. So we basically said, so we're going to need to get some information about patients uh, and then mine new published information, clinical trials, uh, all the new information that gets published in the world. And that's what we did. So people, it's a cons we launched it as a consumer facing website initially to gauge whether people are interested in it and whether they could understand this and whether they can provide enough information uh, so that we could personalize it. This is how the consumer facing website of MedAdvisor looks. People could go there, enter their email address, uh, and then when it's validated, they receive a form basically that they fill in with information about themselves, their uh, gender, their average, their more or less their date of birth, not not with identifying information, by the way. There's no name here. There's no address. There's no telephone number. There's no date of birth, full date of birth, and so on. So really, no social security or anything like that. People basically can uh, sign up rather anonymously, but we do need an email address to notify them when there's something new. And after they provide this information, for every medical condition they say they have, we ask them, a bunch of other questions to understand their current situation, the current status, the, the treatment history, the response to that treatment, and the current treatment, and what are they contemplating in terms of treatments. And a, then based on this, we create a personalized report, sort of the state of the art of science, medical science, for your specific situation. And this is different than what you might find anywhere else online because it's personalized. So take for example two people, one of them, they both have prostate cancer, but one of them has already undergone, it's a, has already undergone a prostatectomy, the removal of the prostate, and the other has not. So the one that undergone a prostatectomy already does not need to know what the, uh, for instance, what the pr prostate is. They already know what the prostate is. They don't need to know how to treat the prostate in place. There's no prostate to treat. 
and they don't need to know how, what are the options of taking that prostate out. On the other hand, that, the, all that information is extremely useful for the person that still has a prostate. They need to make decisions. Do they go through, uh, how do they do it? Do they treat it in place and so on and so forth. So all of this is captured in this personalized refresher. Then we start providing updates, such as matching clinical trials. We know enough about the individual to say, okay, there's specific clinical trials that may be really useful for you and you may be eligible for because we understand where you are and what are the eligibility, inclusion and exclusion criteria for those clinical trials. Latest research that gets published in scientific journals, treatment options that are available, guidelines that get published, community resources, lifestyle tips, experts, uh, and medivisor tips. For instance, we would take something from a scientific journal and re review it and summarize it and rephrase it in sort of cliff notes in 300 words, 10th grade English. Um, and this is uh, making it accessible because otherwise, they, even if they do go and download the scientific journal uh, article, uh, they may not understand it all. They probably won't. So we interpret statistics for them and we, inter and we also unravel any biases uh, and reveal it and we contrast, contrast it with other science. Uh, people tell us whether it's helpful or not and that's how we know that 90% of what we deliver to patients, to our subscribers, is relevant and helpful. And when it isn't, it often is uh, because the profile was not filled in correctly. They can then discuss it with other patients that are in the same situation like them and receive this item because they are both on the same platform and receiving the same item. And when there is a clinical trial that matches them from an eligibility, inclusion, exclusion perspective, uh, they would get notified and they could apply directly to the clinical trial on the platform. So they see where the trials are compared to where they live. Uh, we show them trials even far away from where they are because uh, this woman in California we gave an example of may want to go to a clinical trial in Texas because there's nothing happening in California. So uh, she has a relative in Texas that's nearby to that clinical trial so they may want to sign up there. And uh, of course they may use this on the go. In fact, more than 50% of our subscribers are coming now through doctors. We have a program for, called Medivisor MD that allows doctors and clinics to uh, invite their patients to Medivisor. Uh, and uh, when they basically, so I'll tell you a bit about that in a second, but the patients can actually start signing up for Medivisor as they're waiting in the clinic. Uh, and they do this today, and the doctor, the benefit for the practice is several fold. Uh, the patients are more educated, so they ask actually about less nonsense. You have to remember, the doctors are pulling their hair out with all the crap the patients are bringing to them that they find online. It's driving them nuts. It's not just that they uh, are overwhelmed by medical science, they're actually unable, they're really wasting time on patients bringing in nonsense, going off their treatment paths uh, because they learned something online or they heard something or they saw this natural or alternative remedy uh, and so on. So this gives them the latest cutting edge medical science. It doesn't limit their options, uh, but it's all vetted at least. Uh, and they bring less of a pile of information to discuss and they're more educated and empowered patients take care of, better care of themselves. So uh, the doctor also has a weekly digest of what their patients are receiving. So there's many advantages for medical institutions to prescribe or invite Medivisor to uh, invite their patients to Medivisor. And as I said, there's uh, over 50 clinics in the U.S. right now that are inviting their patients to Medivisor day in day out, and uh, dozens of medical institutions are doing this. We have over 100 doctors on the platform right now. So that's, a, if you want to learn more about that, uh, send us a, an email or afterwards and we'll uh, help your practice get on to Medivisor MD. Um, I'll, I'll take a break just a second if there are any questions.
Okay. I don't see any additional questions, right? I'll proceed. So basically, if, you, if I summarize this, we treat every person as a unique individual, just like their fingerprints or DNA. Then using patent pending technology, a medical human expertise curated in a Wikipedia-like manner, and the wisdom of the crowds, which are the digital footsteps of each of the subscribers that are using MetaVisor, create what I call a laser-focused beam of health information. Basically, just pinpointing the information to that individual uh, that matters to them. And so that's a uh, the team. By the way, I'm, I saw uh, a lot of my background was already told in the preface. My uh, colleague uh, Owen, he's a uh, he was with me in elementary school, so we're friends for many years. Uh, he was on faculty at Yale and Columbia, and started at least five other health tech companies, uh, which are several of which are running companies. And Professor Steve Kaplan, he's a world famous urologist, uh, number one in the world in BPH, according to some uh, estimates. Uh, he co-authored over 800 publications. He's been on a dozen editorial boards uh, of scientific journals. And he's been the chief of men's health at Wild Cornell, and now he's professor of urology at Mount Sinai. Uh, he also co-founded Metadata Solutions. Uh, so together we have the uh, a technology background, a business background, and a medical background. To do this, we have a rock star advisory board with uh, leaders in various scientific fields, uh, medical and, uh, and patient uh, advocacy. Um, you could all read this on our website. We're not the only solution, though, to health information, as you could imagine. Here are a few other interesting solutions that I want to call out because patients are uh, still seeking information. Uh, for instance, uh, clinicaltrials.gov, which I showed you earlier, even though it's a pain sometimes and it's not very easy to understand, uh, sometimes it's worth the effort to try to refine a search to, and to continuously try to seek clinical trials. Uh, there's another service uh, of a company called Trial Reach which if you have diabetes, you may want to use as well. Uh, so, uh, but it's not yet relevant to everybody with any any, for any clinical trial or for any medical condition. And again, of course, you could use Metavisor for finding clinical trials. Uh, then there's a PubMed, which is a really a, when, where every published research gets indexed. Uh, now, uh, this is for people that have a lot of time on their hand and want to go down into the details. They could try to uh, seek out this information, but they wouldn't necessarily know whether it's clinically relevant. There are a couple of online patient communities, like, uh, like Metavisor, but in this case, they're still broader uh, for more medical conditions, uh, like patients like me and, and Inspire. Uh, so you could join Metavisor, patients like me and Inspire as well. Uh, people that are seeking health information for themselves may join more than one service. A uh, health tap allows asking questions for doctors. Uh, one interesting one here is CrowdMed. Is there a question or anything? This popped up right now. So I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll call out CrowdMed. Uh, everything we spoke about so far is really, it's a post-diagnosis. There is a big step in what I call health anxiety and self-diagnosis. There is over 70 tools, 70 different online services for self-diagnosis. A research was recently published that showed that none of them are very accurate. But they're getting better. So use them with a grain of salt, never, never really start treating or, or prevent treatment or stop discontinue treatment because of a self-diagnosis. I would never advise doing that. Uh, but um, there is a, a kind of, if there is no diagnosis, it's the worst situation. When something is wrong and you don't know why or what's going on. And CrowdMed is uh, using wisdom of the crowds of medical uh, sleuths or detectives 
to try to help uh, figure these cases out. And it's a very, very interesting service using the market economics and, uh, and the human expertise in a very interesting way. So if there is uh, somebody that is undiagnosed or feels like the diagnosis is not correct, uh, of course, second opinions are still the uh, better, the standard, uh, but consider also crowd men. So uh, these are other interesting services, but generally to, we're not sure that there is something that really provides what Medivisor provides today in terms of personalized health information across a broad spectrum of types of information ranging from latest research to treatment options to clinical trials to guidelines to warnings to community resources and all on a personalized basis where 90% of what you get is really personally relevant to you. Uh, so just to summarize before we go into Q&A, there's many patterns, uh, actually five distinct patterns of how many information people seek for health information online. After cancer diagnosis, over 60% become seekers. Um, and we talked earlier about how those are split up. Most of the solutions today are, are inadequate because uh, people don't find what they're looking for. There's a lot of generic health information, but very little specific. Um, so it's hard to find those solutions. And personalized health information, at least in my mind, is the future uh, because people want to get better information. Uh, and, but at the time of need, when we're coping with illness or caring for someone with illness, it's really not the time we want to spend all our days on the computer. Uh, and it's happened to me and it's happened to many that I know. So uh, that's why we're trying to help the millions of people connect with the information that matters to them most. After all, each of us is unique. So should our health information be? That's what we're trying to do with Metavisor. So now I'll open up for questions. Thank you, Tal. Um, that was a great discussion. Um, and I'm checking to see if there are any new questions. We'll certainly leave it open to see if anybody wants to type in a new question. Uh, again, we uploaded the slide deck there in the handout section, so you have some time still to download. And in terms of uh, connecting with Tal after this, um, your email is tal, tal at metavisor.com, correct? Yes. Uh, okay. All right. Um, all right. Well, we here at First Healthcare Compliance are here to help you with compliance solution tailored to your business, be it a hospital, hospital network, healthcare practice of any size, billing company, or skilled nursing facility. Please visit our website at 1STHCC.com, or if you'd like to request a demo, please email us at info at 1STHCC.com, or you can call us at 888 Five four three four seven seven eight. And in the meantime, I do not see any further questions. But um, thank you very much for your time, and we'll see you in a month.